Hello viewers, thank you for joining me. The World Ends With You is one of my all-time favorite video games, so when I heard it was getting an anime adaptation, there was really no question of whether or not I was going to check it out. Anime adapted from games don't have a great track record. Maybe I'll talk about Danganronpa on here someday. So I really tried to temper my expectations going in. I was hoping to be pleasantly surprised, but I thought I was prepared for it to be a disappointment, too. This is the show I alluded to in last month's review, the one that I just had to put down for a while. Not even because it was a total train wreck, but because it was consistently disappointing me where it really mattered. Sorry, I know I'm jumping way ahead. The point here is that for a while, that disappointment killed my desire to talk about it at all. I was already so attached to this story in a different medium. It wasn't even fun to continue it as a hate watch, something I could rant about later. I'd wanted it to be good. But it occurred to me that at the very least, the anime adaptation offered the perfect opportunity to talk about what made the original game so great, even if it's only in the context of where the show failed. So this review is going to address a mix of both, anime and game. I do plan on spoilers up to about the halfway point of the story, for anyone who's blind. And this may not sound like a very promising start, but I am going to try not to be too negative. The World Ends With You opens with Neku Sakuraba waking up in Shibuya, a popular shopping district in Tokyo. Except, he notices immediately that things are a little weird. He doesn't have any memories, for one, but that's honestly the least of his problems. No one can see or hear him, but when someone walks right through him, he realizes he can hear their thoughts, which he also doesn't have much time to linger on before he's attacked by frog monsters. While fleeing from the monsters, he runs into a girl in the same position. They form a pact, which is like a connection between their souls, and it gives them the ability to use various magical powers to fight back. There'll be more on that later. His new partner's name is Shiki, and luckily, she's better informed than he is. Shiki explains that the monsters are called Noise, and they'll have to fight them off to survive the seven-day Reapers game. For each of the seven days, they'll be given a mission to accomplish as players. The Reapers are basically the other team, earning points by summoning Noise to defeat and erase players, though they can only attack the players directly on day seven. And the Head Reaper, the one who gives out the missions, is known as the Game Master. This game is taking place in a different version of Shibuya, known as the Underground. All the people Neku couldn't interact with exist in the real ground, the regular Shibuya. Anyone who enters the game is given a player pin, which allows them to read the minds of people in the real ground. And there's another twist. Something that seems pretty obvious in hindsight, though it isn't revealed to Neku until the week's almost over, is that all the players are dead. They're competing to be brought back to life, and for the return of their entry fee. When you enter the game, the Game Master takes whatever you value most, which explains Neku's amnesia. So let's talk about our hero a bit. Neku's lost his memories, but not his personality. Your life experiences are the strongest determining factor of who you are as a person, and you could say that's what Neku values most. Himself. Neku Sakuraba is the epitome of your edgy, brooding teenager. Shibuya is a busy place, full of all sorts of people. As far as Neku's concerned, the only important viewpoint is his own. Other people are the real noise. He's a bit much as an adult, though thankfully in an entertaining way, not a truly irritating one. But there was something welcoming about it as a teenager. I think we all went through that edgy, super cynical phase at some point, and most heroes in games or TV shows that I was familiar with had this ingrained optimism to them. I feel like Neku's character is really well designed to draw in people who think like him, 
which is part of why seeing him grow over the course of the story is so moving, I like to think it could have a real-world impact on people. Teamwork is central to surviving the Reaper's game. You could probably guess that teamwork isn't something that comes naturally to Neku. Luckily, his partner is nothing like him. Shiki puts up with all his bullshit and then some, even when he snaps at her or spends most of the first few days just flat out ignoring her. She always does her best to point out the bright side of the situation, even when she doesn't really feel it herself. And more importantly, she's always getting them caught up in other people's problems, finding a way to help them even when they're low on time for their missions, Though, of course, the things they learn from helping others usually helps to solve the mystery of the mission that day. Until eventually, Neku's forced to admit that, though he's the stronger fighter, he wouldn't be able to get through this game without her, either. But Shiki's not perfect, either. She's got her own growing to do. It's a bit subtle, even in the game, but a lot of Shiki's good cheer is forced. The game is a lot heavier on the inner monologuing, so we're able to see Shiki doubting herself even when she's putting on her best face for Neku. That's the best way I can put it, actually. To say she's putting on another face. Near the end of their week, they happen across a girl in the real ground who looks identical to Shiki, and we learn that Shiki's entry fee, what she valued most, was also herself, just in a different way. Shiki as we see her now is a recreation of her best friend Eri, who was bubbly and popular and seemingly good at everything. Shiki herself was a lot mousier, shy, not as strikingly beautiful, and incredibly jealous of her best friend. They had this dream to make clothes together, and though Shiki was the more talented seamstress, Eri got all the attention for being the designer. It was only once she got what she thought she wanted, being Airy, that she realized how much she valued her own skills and her role in their friendship, that it takes an amazing friend to make you jealous. I'm not gonna pretend The World Ends With You isn't a little heavy-handed with the whole power of friendship aspect of the story, but there are some things that are subtly beautiful. Shiki's forced cheer is her trying to imitate Eri, what she viewed as the superior mindset, but it does nothing but annoy Neku. It's only once she starts to open up about her doubts that they start to actually get along. It sends a great message about being yourself, and I loved seeing them come together as a real team by the time they're ready to take on the Game Master at the end of their week. I did say that I wasn't going to spoil the whole story, so you might have deduced by now that this isn't Neku's last time playing the Reaper's game. They succeed in taking down the first Game Master, but the rug is pulled out from under them when they meet with the game's conductor, second only to the composer, the real boss, who tells them that only one player is to be restored to life this time, and the player who's won that honor is Shiki. They share a heartfelt goodbye, agreeing to find each other in the real ground one day, and Neku agrees to play the game again, but any feel-good vibes are short-lived. A new game means a new entry fee, so Kitaniji returns Neku's memories, of everything but how he died, and claims what Neku now values most, Shiki's life. Her restoration is put on hold, and Neku starts week two fighting to save her, alongside a new partner who will test everything he's learned so far. And believe me, I'll get into him a bit later. You really can't discuss this story, even without full spoilers, without talking about Joshua. But it's time we talk a bit about the anime specifically. I want to start with some positives, because it wasn't all bad. The anime was… okay. One of the really standout things from the game was the music, and it was great to hear some familiar songs in the soundtrack. I really liked the way the anime looked, too. Maybe that style wouldn't have worked for just any anime, but it felt really true to the style of the game, and the fights were generally pretty fun to watch, if a bit brief. 
That brevity wasn't always a huge deal, but it did bother me with some of the later fights. The ones that were some of the harder boss fights in the game. I wanted to really feel that struggle, and it just wasn't there a lot of the time. Another rough point was the pin system. In the game, you collect and equip, and can upgrade, various pins that allow you to use different abilities in battle. There was really a lot of variety, allowing players to experiment and find the ones they liked best. Obviously, that kind of thing was going to be a little hard to translate into the anime, what with the time limitations. It didn't have to be anything extensive, but literally all we get is, you have a partner, you can use magic powers now. A good adaptation should be able to stand alone. If you're going to involve a magic system, you have to explore it at least a little. We see Neku's abilities getting stronger over time, but there's no training, no struggling to figure out how new pins work. It just wasn't enough. But nothing hurt more than the places they let down the characters. To put it simply, the characters you see in the anime come across like pale imitations of their game selves. There's nothing really over the top about them, and they're needed to be. Shiki's sweet, but kind of generically so. It never feels like she's really going out of her way to convince Neku to give other people a chance. They stripped Neku of almost all his inner monologues. The anime doesn't give you the full extent of how dismissive he is of other people. It's like, anime Neku is brooding in a quiet way, game Neku is brooding in an edgy way. They both just feel kind of bland. And so, of course, seeing Neku open up and let people in over time just doesn't have the same impact. The events of week one are pretty rushed, which I knew they might be, anime time constraints and all. We speed through week one in the first three episodes. I won't say it didn't bother me at all that the missions were totally stripped of any sense of mystery, but that's easier to forgive than them struggling with the character interactions. Because Neku's relationship with Shiki are the real building blocks of the story, and if you get the foundation wrong, everything else is going to suffer. So it's time I figure out how to describe Joshua, because the second act of this story really is just as important as the first. Neku's running around on day one of week two, determined to find the most capable partner possible so he can breeze through this game and save Shiki, when he's forcibly pacted with a mysterious boy named Yoshia Kiryu, who usually goes by Joshua, who says he's been watching Neku. I'll leave you to find the answers to Josh's mysteries yourself, but right from the start, he's definitely shady. He tells Neku he's always been able to see the underground, and he's looking for something here. But more importantly, Neku can scan him to read his thoughts, something other players should be immune to, and when he does get into Joshua's head, he sees scenes that look suspiciously like they're from his own death. But what's harder to find words for is Joshua's general demeanor. He's such a sassy little shit, but I'm not going to pretend he isn't absolutely my favorite character. Where Neku mostly kept it to himself, Joshua is openly mocking and dismissive. He is so much fun to watch as a character, but he's the kind of kid you wouldn't have been able to spend an hour with in real life without strangling him. He thinks he's better than everyone else and doesn't try to pretend otherwise. And there's no one he loves messing with more than Neku, particularly now that Neku's stuck with him as his partner. As the week goes on and we spend more time with Josh, it becomes clear that he views other people, and how much value they have to his life, pretty much exactly the way Neku did just a week ago. Joshua is Neku's real test. He's learned that, above all else, if he wants to survive this game, he must trust his partner but Joshua isn't making himself easy to trust. Joshua in the anime is almost unrecognizable from his game counterpart. The shady details that are important to the story are still there, of course, but his personality... Joshua comes across like he's disinterested in the game, but he's doing his best to be reasonable. The difference almost can't be put into words without just showing you the words, 
One of the best examples I can give you is the scene where Neku steps back, takes a breath, and just tries to reason with Josh when Joshua gets a little more stubborn about ditching the mission. He explains about Shiki, how important it is to him that they win the game and save her, and Joshua doesn't answer at first. When Neku asks if he's even listening, this is Josh's answer. Uh-huh, and here's me, playing the world's tiniest violin. Did you think you were special? Every player here put up something they loved. Everybody makes sacrifices. Like, not getting Neku or Shiki quite right bothers me for story reasons. And his interactions with Joshua are important to the story, too. But not portraying Josh faithfully hurt me on a personal level. While watching the anime, I often felt like the writers were just given an outline of plot points or something. You will get the full story watching the anime, but the real heart isn't there. I will say again that the anime isn't awful, just sort of mediocre. It did do some things I liked. We see a little more of Eri, for one. Seeing her going about her life in the real ground helps motivate Neku on more than one occasion. And that final challenge scene near the end actually made a change I really liked. In the game, when Neku makes his decision, he kinda just looks defeated and resigned. Seeing him smile and hold out his hand in the anime, because he's truly taken to heart that he needs to just have faith in his partners, that was pretty great. I often describe The World Ends With You as one of the best games I've ever played, but every time I go back through the story like this, I'm filled with the conviction that, no, this is THE best game I've ever played. I'm not sure any other game's story has ever moved me quite like this. They managed to tell a story about the importance of allowing people of all types into your life without it feeling preachy. It really does feel like it was meant to draw in kids like Neku who've closed themselves off, people who think their world is the only one worth getting to know. Which is why it stresses me out a little to see the anime adaptation not live up to expectations. Because I know the anime is generally going to be a lot more accessible than the game. For potential new fans, it's cheaper and easier to just watch the show. Which is why I can't stress enough that, though you'll get the whole story, it really doesn't do justice to the character interactions or life lessons. At least watching someone else's playthrough of the game will definitely enhance the experience and is worth your time. And I hope the anime does manage to expand the fan base. It deserves recognition. Thank you for watching.